the whole cana canid family they just all seem to be able to kind of cross over and there's a lot of mixing yeah, going canid, on yeah so. um, canid soup is the term that that comes up um, <laughs> Hey guys, I'm Eric Olson, and welcome to another episode of the Science Centric Podcast. About six years ago, a wildlife biologist noticed a pack of mysterious creatures living on Galveston Island, a barrier island off the Gulf Coast of Texas. The creatures looked an awful lot like coyotes, but also red wolves, an ancient coyote wolf hybrid that has been extinct in the wild for nearly 40 years. Eventually, scientists collected DNA samples from the mystery creatures tested and analyzed them. The results showed they were coyotes harboring genes from the red wolf. This meant that even though the red wolf disappeared from the area a long time ago, at least in dog years, its genes lived on through the coyotes. Our guest today is Liz Heppenheimer, a Princeton biologist who studied the DNA samples from Galveston's mystery canids. Her work was published late last year in the science journal called Genes. Liz and I spoke about the study, what it means for conservation, and why canid species seem to have trouble keeping their genes to themselves. Liz, welcome to the Science Centric Podcast. So glad to have you here, and you're coming in crystal clear, which is awesome. Excellent. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. All right. Awesome. Um, so I guess a good place to start would be to talk about this concept of introgression which is an important concept in biology, important to the, to, to the work that you do. And what is introgression? Why is it important to evolution and biodiversity? Yeah, so introgression is a fancy technical term for what happens at the genetic level when there's hybridization between species. So two distinct species interbreed, their offspring has a mix of genes from both parents, and those genes have introgressed is the technical term. And in recent history in biology, this was something that was considered kind of rare, which is very intuitive because you have two distinct species, they're adapted to different environments, their offspring will be that intermediate that's adapted to neither of the parental environments, and that offspring will die. Um, but with the advent of new genome sequencing technologies, we're circling back around to find that this is actually very common and definitely not necessarily bad because because it does introduce new genetic diversity to a population and so that's why it's important for evolution so when we think about species i think there's a there's a common conception that species you know what helps define a species is that they cannot interbreed it, it is genome genome sequencing is that kind of shattering that idea or, or blurring those boundaries between different species? It's definitely blurring the boundaries. Um, with respect to species concepts, in biology there are dozens if not hundreds of recognized species concepts. The most common one is what you just mentioned, the biological species concept, which says that species are defined by this inability to interbreed. But that's definitely not the only species concept and with genome sequencing we're, we're definitely coming around to maybe that's not the best species concept and species may be better defined by distinct ecological roles different living in different environments hunting different prey anything like that might mm. be a, a slightly better definition but that's still a controversial idea yeah i mean it seems that there's um you know a bit of a political aspect to this, um, not not in terms of, you know, red, red state, blue state politics, but in terms of, you know, sort of po politics within science and conservation in terms of how we define species. I know um, I, look, I, I worked on or edited an article for somebody that was about giraffes. And there, I don't know if you saw that paper, but there was this idea that, well, these, you know, giraffes were categorized into these subspecies, well, now people are saying they're species, and that provides greater protection in terms of conservation. Do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, so it's it's a very human thing to try to name everything, um, where in reality, it, species are kind of a spectrum. You, you have two things that are, are very obviously different species, giraffes and polar bears. But then when you come back to what I work on, the canids, the wolves and coyotes, it's 
it's a little less clear that they're as distinct. And for policy, it's very convenient when you can delineate specific groups and call it a specific thing, but that doesn't totally match up with the biology in, in all cases. And that makes management hard when you don't know what to call something and define it. Right, right. That makes sense. Okay, so I think this is a good segue into talking about your paper, which came out in December, which found that coyotes in the South, uh, I, don't, I almost said South America, in the Southern United States mm -hmm. have harbor genes from something called a red wolf, which I think most people are not familiar with. So what exactly is a red wolf and how did coyotes end up with red wolf genes? Yeah, so that's a great question. And it, it sounds simple, but it's not necessarily a simple question to answer. So red wolves are, in the simplest terms, a small species of wolf, a legally recognized species of wolf, that has a historical range in the southeastern United States. From about Texas over to the Atlantic coast, up to maybe Pennsylvania. Um, and it was one of the first species protected um, under the Endangered Species Act in the 70s. Uh, and by that time, it had very critical, critically low numbers. Um, various reasons are cited for this, um, humans being a very big one. Uh, and coyotes were also moving into the area at that time. Uh, they were undergoing a range expansion. So there, there are some thoughts that maybe coyotes outcompeted them. And where, where, are, where would coyotes be found normally? I mean, where, where did they expand from? So coyotes have a complicated history of range expansion and contraction since pre-Columbian times. But prior to uh, 1900, they were restricted to basically west of the Mississippi River. Okay. And then around the beginning of the, the 20th century, they started moving across the whole country north, south, west, every direction. Okay, okay. All right, great. Um, so so they're moving into the Red Wolves, mm -hmm. what historically has been the Red Wolves territory, um, and that's maybe contributing to their decline. Um, yes. And so where, where did we end up in terms of Red Wolves? Because I think most people yeah. haven't <laughs> ever encountered one. Yeah, so in the in the 70s, um, as I said, the, the Endangered Species Act had just passed um, and red wolves were protected. And there was a an initiative to start a captive breeding program. And uh, so the last remaining red wolves, or what were believed to be the last remaining red wolves, were trapped from the Gulf Coast of Louisiana and Texas and evaluated for morphology and um, vocalizations, because they make distinct vocalizations from coyotes. And a handful and of- And sorry, sorry to interrupt, but morphology would be uh, how they look. Yes, and, so and, things like skull shape and overall body size. And what, and what defines a red wolf? I mean, I think when you hear that, you're thinking of something that looks like a fox, basically. Yeah, so they're not actually red. That's um, one of the biggest misconceptions about them. They're, they're a little bit of a, a rusty color, but not red like a red fox is red. Uh, they are bigger than coyotes. Uh -huh. There's a, a whole suite of morphological traits that um, are distinct from coyotes, mostly in the craniodental uh, nose area okay. um, and overall body size, too. Okay. Uh, so they do look different from a coyotes, and they, they make different sounds. Okay. So in the in the 70s, in these trapping efforts, they evaluated every canid that they caught and decided which were represented red, what we think of as a red wolf. And those individuals were selected for a captive breeding program uh -huh. through um, the Point Defiant Zoo and Aquarium yeah. in Tacoma, Washington. Yes. And so after several generations of captive breeding, it was assumed that they took all the red wolves from the landscape. They're extinct in the wild. They're only in the zoo population. And after less than a decade, I think, of captive breeding, they were released in North Carolina for an ex it was called the experimental population. They're still alive today, but they're, they're dwindling a little bit, which is, mm -hmm. has to do a lot with the controversy surrounding red wolves today in, in North Carolina. So, so they're so they're really restricted to a very small mm -hmm. area. I mean, they're not 
that common at all. Yeah, to, to my knowledge, they do not exist outside of, a yeah. pure rest yeah. does not exist outside of this yeah. recovery area in North Carolina. Okay. So, which is, is dwindling <laughs> under political controversy <laughs> at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so the basis of your paper um, was that a wildlife biologist, I believe in Galveston, Texas, found uh, a group of coyotes that exhibited some of the features of the red wolf. So could you just talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so it's actually, it, it's kind of a funny story. Um, I, I work in a canid genetics lab. We get um, all kinds of emails of like this, I saw this weird looking animal, like, can you do a genetic test? Um, like <laughs> getting emails like that, like once a month. Yeah. And a, a lot of the time, it doesn't turn out to be more than a coyote. There's quite a lot of variation in what coyotes look like. And these people that are sending us these emails, they're not wrong that the coyote looks weird. It just turns out to be, be a coyote. So are, do, do they think that it's some kind of, you know, strange animal that uh, hasn't been identified by science does that happen often uh, well it's not like i think this is the cheap <laughs> that's, that's exactly what i was thinking the cheap yeah, yeah. <laughs> usually they think it's like a coyote dog hybrid or, or a coyote wolf hybrid right and for um, our audience the chupacabra is a mythical uh uh hispanic uh, or mexican uh sort of mythical creature that sucks the goat or sucks the blood of goats so <laughs> yes <laughs> yes so no, no one said i think i found the chupacabra uh, yes. okay all right just just but, checking <laughs> uh, we got this email god maybe about three years ago now from ron wooten who's a wildlife biologist in texas and he says i think this animal looks like a, a red wolf or the, this group of animals really look like red wolves if i send you a tissue sample would you be able to to tell us tell us what it is and um we the it was three of us really working on this project at the time we're looking at these pictures being like yeah like that kind of does look like a red wolf like we're yeah. really we're interested in in getting this sample and then uh, you know a few months later ron um had found some some roadkill opportunistic um, he, he definitely didn't do any um, anything to actively get the samples and sent us um, one tissue chunk and one bloody scalpel that he had used to take a sample from um, one of the animals. Uh -huh. So it, it was very memorable at the time because we, we get so many samples, we process so much stuff, but we'd never gotten like an actual scalpel <laughs> for it that we're soaking in buffer to get the, the blood off of to, to extract <laughs> DNA. So we're just like having a, a fun time in the lab yeah. with this because, with these samples. Because most of the most of the time you're probably dealing with little clear test tubes of exactly. liquid and you've got, you know, something bloody very, coming in, you know. Yeah, it was very CSI like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like investigating this. Um so so I, I do remember clearly doing the lab work. Um and so as I said, we're we're a canid genetics and genomics lab primarily, although yeah. not exclusively. And so we have this incredible panel of reference samples of coyotes from practically every state at this point, every species of wolves. We have samples from the original founder red wolves of the captive populations. So we sequenced these two individuals from Ron that were suspected to be red wolves. And then we had all these great DNA samples to compare it to and say, what is this most similar to? Yeah. And it turned out that the two Galveston samples consistently shared genes with um, red wolves that were largely absent from regional coyotes. Mm -hmm. So coyotes from, I think we had Alabama uh, in the study, they had none of these genes. Whereas the coyotes, coyotes in um, Galveston had had a higher proportion of these red wolf genes. Mm -hmm. So going back to this idea of, um, you know, introgression, mm -hmm. um, which this, is, this appears to be a case of, is, I mean, would you categorize these animals as a different species? Or are they a red wolf? Or, or are they a coyote? Or, or, you know, what percentage of genes do they share with these other species? Yeah, so th this is kind of difficult to tell. 
exactly what percentage of genes overall because we're only sampling a subset of the genome. Oh, okay. So we, we can say for sure that it, it's higher than the regional average of um, what what we consider a coyote to, to share with a red wolf. They do share common ancestors, so they'll, they share DNA for that reason. Yeah. Um, but it, it, this does appear to be a case of a recent hybridization event between Texas coyotes and red wolves. Since red wolves have been extinct, or supposedly extinct, from the Gulf Coast since the 70s, this was a hybridization event that likely took place around that in the late 60s when coyotes were first moving into the area. Oh, uh, okay. Okay, mm -hmm. that makes sense. So, yeah, in, in ecological terms, hybridization between species tends to happen when there's low population density. So coyotes were first coming into the area, there weren't a lot of other coyotes there, they encountered a red wolf close enough kind of situation. Right. <laughs> and red wolves were also in decline at this time. So there's, it's a, the sort of both parties were, were settling. Right. And I mean, red wolves are essentially a, a hybrid of gray wolves and coyotes. Is that correct? Maybe. That's, that's, <laughs> that's a controversial question. It, it does depend on who you ask, um, experts in the field. There are um, two, two camps of, of researchers that believe um, red wolves are the, the product of a hybridization between gray wolf and coyote and others that believe it is a distinct species. Oh, very interesting. Okay. Um, so I laughed because... Uh, Usually when I talk to uh, PhDs, they won't say maybe. They'll say, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I consider myself a, a neutral party. <laughs> so you're, you're, not in, you're not in either political camp. Uh, okay, interesting. Um, I mean, I know there are other uh, coyote-wolf hybrids. There's something called a koi wolf. Mm -hmm. um, I believe the eastern wolf has some coyote genes too and i don't know if those are different species i i yeah um, well, that's, I, a, that's another maybe actually um yeah so uh there's there's several um sort of models of of evolu the red wolf evolutionary history in that they may be a distinct species or they may be a distinct species that is also the same as the eastern wolf so that's um the three species hypothesis that we have coyotes gray wolves, and then eastern wolves and red wolves compose a third species. Hmm. Very interesting. Okay. Um, so I guess my question would be, you know, how do you, how are coyotes and wolves able to uh, sort of hook up and get together and make, <laughs> make these <laughs> hybrids? How does that happen? Because you wouldn't necessarily think that was happening but actually in the course of researching this um doing some research for this uh, interview um i found out something else interesting which was that black wolves mm -hmm. um the only reason they're black is because they actually hi hybridized with domesticated dogs that were black and i was like wow that's really interesting i mean the whole the whole cana canid family they just all seem to be able to kind of crossover and there's a lot of mixing yeah, going canid, on. Yeah, so. um, canid soup is the term that, that comes up uh, <laughs> most often. So the, the short answer to all of this is that um, canids are just, they're not that divergent from each other. Mm -hmm. um, estimates of when um, coyotes and, and wolves, when that lineage split, ranges from one to two million years to maybe as recently as like a hundred thousand years, mm -hmm. which in evolutionary time is is very short. They are they have distinct ecological roles, but they're probably just not divergent enough to have built up reproductive barriers uh, that we typically see in the biological species concepts that are preventing species from interbreeding. Okay, and um, I mean what would be keeping those populations separated um, normally. It's just an ecological niche and- It is, exactly. Okay, interesting. Yeah, I don't know enough about sort of population biology to understand how that, how that happens. But um, I mean, I guess you see it all over the place. I mean, you see it with 
birds and you know especially on islands where maybe a, a bird species would evolve to you know have a, a ground dwelling species and a and a you know a tree dwelling species and they're kind of occupying different niches but they're they're actually closely related you know yeah exactly okay so i guess i do understand that on some level (laughs) (laughs) um so in your opinion do you think that the red wolf deserves endangered species status i know you mentioned that that was there's kind of two camps as to whether this is actually a separate species whether it's a subspecies of maybe the gray wolf or a different species altogether. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so there are these two camps, um, but as far as I'm aware, no one in any camp or, or neutral parties think that red wolf shouldn't be protected. Mm-hmm. They are definitely have unique aspects to their, to their genome, to their ecology, to their, um, yeah, to their, their morphology, they, they are unique whether that's unique because it's a subspecies of, of gray wolf or unique because it, it independently evolved. Um, it, it doesn't really matter. Mm-hmm. They, they should be protected under all species hypotheses. They are eligible for protection under the Endangered Species Act. And we definitely, everyone thinks they should be. And related to that, what does your discovery of red wolf genes in coyotes mean for conservation of the red wolves? Um, Is there a way to use these genes, this different population of red wolf genes, in a way that can support conservation of the existing population like that you mentioned in North Carolina? Yeah, so part of what we discovered or or discussed in the paper is that these uh, coyotes carry red wolf genes Um, that are found in the captive population from which the North Carolina population descends. Um, But they also probably have variation that was lost in this captive breeding bottleneck. So we could potentially bring back some red wolf genetic variation that had previously been lost. I do caution a little bit um, an immediate conservation action from this paper. We've just sort of found that we we thought red wolf genes were extinct on the landscape in this region. They're not. Um, we need to investigate further to see what else is out there and how we could maybe use it to reintroduce diversity to um, the captive population or in the North Carolina population. And so the 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 group of wolves in Texas. I mean, there's or uh, sorry, group of coyotes with red wolf genes. <laughs> they're still in Texas. I mean, they're still living there, right? They're still living there. Um, There's, from what I understand, a pretty active population on Galveston Island that look red Mm wolfy. I don't have a a count on how many animals it actually is, but but they're definitely a a living population or a living group. So even though there's not immediate plans, um, you know, how would you go, how would you do that? I mean, how, how would you sort of introduce those genes into that? Uh, captive or sort of is it a captive population it's seven- uh, there, there are captive populations in zoos but it's it's a wild population that's what? In North Carolina. yeah the north let's just call them the north carolina po- population how how would you how would you go about doing something like that so for, for one extreme you, you could transport an animal from from texas to to north carolina <laughs> um another alternative is that since the the north carolina population is, is controversial and not doing so well um, under political controversy that maybe Galveston is a more appropriate site to release um, have a release a captive population of, of red wolves that a lot of things need to happen before we, we actually do that but it, it, it's something that could be on the table for for future red wolf um, conservation efforts so the goal there would be that the 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 wolves would be introduced and they'd sort of integrate into this population and eventually those genes would sort of take over and essentially you'd have a predominantly red wolf uh genetically red wolf population there yeah so red wolves and coyotes do interbreed in north carolina uh 
under very specific circumstances that involve like gunshot mortality during the breeding season and a breeding pair gets disrupted, uh-huh. then the red wolves will, will mate with coyotes in that situation. Generally, they seem to prefer not to, um, which goes back to like the ecological um, species concept I was talking about before. Mm-hmm. So the idea for Galveston would be that if they did mate with a coyote, at least it would be a coyote that carried some red wolf genes instead of a coyote that doesn't. Right. Not necessarily to, to merge the two populations. Right, right. So, I mean, you'd probably have to coordinate that a bit and sort of... That, that would be a huge, huge... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a lot of things need to happen before, before this can be done. Yes. So I, of... Yeah. I can see why you're saying that, that, that yeah, it's not going to happen tomorrow. Definitely. <laughs> Great. Thanks again. Thanks so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. I'm glad we could do this. Yeah, thanks for having me. This is great. Hey, that's it for this show. If you learned something, be sure to smash those like and subscribe buttons right down there. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.